Uh, my name is Matthew Duty. I'm from Dragody, New Brunswick, uh, in the Acadian Peninsula. Um, I am 30 years old. I was the 48. Uh, I was the 48 one with the new neurolog neurological disease, uh, brain disease, there in New Brunswick. Uh, down here, the thing is, uh, we're full of blueberry field and. Uh, everywhere and we they spray a lot like uh, thousand and thousand and thousand and thousand and thousand of acres like uh, the way I can explain that like we got more blueberry field down here than we have like on lands I was a hard-working man I was 27 years old at the time and uh, I was an iron worker I quit school in grade 8 so I start working out west uh, when I was 14 years old I uh, was a journeyman iron worker, rockbuster, and I was making a pretty good salary, a good physical, very strong little man, uh, with a good oppor opportunity in life, and I joined the union there, and I was making a good life being, you know, making big money and living the dream, like everybody, so. But my life switched up, then everything switched up there in one day. I was always having headaches and feeling like like all on me like oh fuck I'm not feeling good today uh, I don't feel good I don't feel good my brains my brain don't feel great like all the time I see my brother and everything because they were working with me out west it's been a while I was telling them like my brain I don't my brain is not working well like like sometime I look and going like picture pack 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 like fogging and stuff like that and yeah and if I never uh, think I was going sick, so even like that, I never see a neurologic or something like that. So, and then after that, that morning there, when everything starts up, it's like you flip 25, 25 cent a quarter. We call that my life switch right away, and uh, this is where uh, it all starts up. Wake up in the morning, I was shaking. Shaking, shaking, shaking. So I need to cook breakfast, and then I start to cut. I, uh, I put a, uh, some bacon out, and I was trying to cut it, and I start trembling like this, and the knife go out my hand, and then I start start shaking a lot, and then I said like, look at my ex girlfriend, and I said like, I not very feel good, and then she look at me, she probably rest another hour because it was very early in the morning, it was like six in the morning or five thirty in the morning, and it was the twenty three of March 2020, I think. It was not already COVID. COVID was just like two months after. And then I go rest, and after that I wake up, and I tell, I call her because she was working at her store. She got a business, so I was giving her a hand, and she don't want me to go out with anymore to make a living down here because I was making too much. Stretched down there eight months, seven months, three months, whatever. So everybody that work out with, they know how it goes. So. In the morning over there, I wake up and not feeling good. So after that, she go work her, and then I called her, and I'm like, I'm not feeling good, but I'm still gonna come. And then she said, like, sit in the office, and if you don't feel well, I'm gonna call somebody that's gonna replace me, uh, replace me at the, the job, so you can come with me uh, in the hospital. And then I was like, fine, great. So as soon as I go out, it was very cool. I remember I go like this with a sweatshirt on, and I was eating, man, like the. You can see the heat coming out of me, you know. And then uh, there was a corner uh, where I was living. You just go in the street and maybe not even 20 seconds, you got a big corner. And the only thing I remember, I go and uh, I got a big heart like seizure and I hit the ditch with the truck. So after I hit the ditch there, I was all shaking, all full of sweat, and I was not feeling good, always passing out, passing out, coming back, passing out, and I'm still panicking there alone in the truck. And I rolled the windows down, and I was stuck there, and it was in the morning, like nobody, it's wake in the morning, so I start panicking and put the truck there first, uh, drive rivers and floor it, and like survival mode, Then it's like somebody pick up the truck and put it on the road. So I put the double flashes on with the forward drive on and I just floored the truck and put my head out of the truck and getting some fresh air so I don't pass out. I was white like a, like a ghost. And then there was a buddy there that always come to the store and know me. <clears throat> and then he arrived and said, uh, fuck Matthew, why the fuck are you driving fast like this in the morning? And uh, 
it's a storm right now and you cannot barely see it's very dangerous the only thing I remember I didn't speak to him nothing I just opened the door to the store and I just go like ah, fall down to the ground and I remember they were calling ambulance before they came in it was like they take like one hour and a half and I was shaking on the ground and I was very white shaking 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 and then the only thing I keep saying is I'm dying. I'm, I'm completely dying. Like I never been sick like this before. I don't know what's happening with me. I'm literally dying right here. Ambulance picked me up and then they look at my blood sugar. Blood sugar was at 2.1. So they figured out maybe I was making uh, low diabetes. So they gave me sugar and everything. So they give me like a pop up. And then I wake up like, like all turning around the head and everything. So. After that, they take my pressure. My pressure was very low. And then they put me on all kinds of stuff there with the razor and said, let's go to the hospital. I remember uh, they shocked me one time and the, and, the, and the ambulance getting there. So after that, I arrived at the hospital. The doctor didn't make one test on me. He looked me clearly in the eyes and it was a young man. I remember him and I was pissed off about him. And he looked at me and said, Matthew, uh, you're at the uh, you're his Etienne son, right? Because my dad is known as a depressive man, you know? This is what it is. He said, you got the same genes, so you're depressive, you too. And you're on the burnout and blah, 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 blah. You work too much. No test pass. You give me an IT van and that's it. Go home and rest. So I grabbed the IT van because my panic attack and anxiety come right at the top. Like, I cannot even lift up my head. I was passing out. And then I was like, really, you're not gonna take a test and just do telling me I'm doing a burnout and laughing at me and taking me home. And I was treated like a, a crap, like a dog will go at the vet and be treated better than that. So then I went home because me, I'm the type of guy I don't like to go in the hospital and I was raging and I was not feeling good. And soon as we get out the hospital, it start again. And I remember my leg was stretching like this in my arm and dropping my teeth like this and said, fucking pass it out again and pass it out again. So my ex-girlfriend bring me, he said, fuck it, let's go to uh, Karaket. I arrived to Karaket, I was, uh, she grabbed the wheelchair because I cannot walk. And uh, I remember she put me in a wheelchair, we go in the hospital there, the doctor, I was sitting there in the weight room crying like a baby. And I'm not someone who cries or something like that, i am always been uh, someone very strong and I never saw, show my emotion to nobody and I was and I always been a Turk down here and then I was crying and yelling man are you gonna help me or are you gonna leave me die here and then after that not the nurse that come pick me up but the doctor she said what's happening to you and then I told her I go to tragedy and he said I'm on depression something like that I'm always passing out uh, on CAT I cannot sleep I don't feel good I'm feeling like I'm dying you know and then she said Fuck the the T rage like where you go for inscription, right? So she, she said that my girlfriend that time there bring uh, his paperwork there and that we're gonna bring him in right now, make some blood tests and whatever. And then I remember she put me on oxygen and uh, the heart and everything again. I was already uh, they shaved me up. So she put the patch at the same place as the other hospital. After that, she come in with a sheet there. Hey, Matthew, I found what do you have. I'm like, what I have? She said, you got a big virus. And I was like, OK, that makes sense. Maybe that big virus there make me feel sick like this. OK, I said, what kind of virus? And then she said to me I was having skeleton. Um, that's an old virus. So I put down on Google skeleton and tried to look like how I'm feeling and uh, the thing I was having, if it was like the same, like the, I don't know what you call that, no? uh, uh, like the same symptoms, right? And I look at both symptoms and it was not the same at all. So, and I was still, and then she gave me like meds for that right away, like anti-inflammatory, another one to kill like the bacteria, right? So after that, uh, I was not feeling great again, so, Make it quick and fast. I make uh, the hospital there 28 times with the ambulance and one month. 28 times and ambulance and one month. Can you imagine? And I need to pay that from my pocket, 150 bucks every time. And I was going to tragedy, 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 tragedy. Lame, the hospital right there, they got none. Like it's a small hospital just for blood tests and that's it. 
So I need to go right away from Lamec to go to Tragedy. So that was like one hour and 15 minutes of ride with the ambulance every time. And then I see like the same doctor that telling me I was on depression, like maybe like 15 times on them, 28 times, you know? And then after that, he come mad at me and start yelling at me. I'm like, you're gonna stop coming to this hospital and telling me you need something. You're on the depression and you're gonna stay home and you're gonna sleep and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. I'm telling him like, man, I'm 27 years old. I always work hard in my life. I bust my ass every day. I'm full of energy. No projects too big or too small. You know what I mean? I was young and let's go. I was born and raised tough man. You know what I mean? And I come piss off at him. And after that, he said, I'm going to grab uh, someone there for you. I need to make a call with him. It was like uh, someone for people that like having brain, uh, like a uh, brain, like uh, uh, schizophren or something like that. And I said, what the fuck, man? I'm not schizophren, anything like that. Like, I don't feel good, man. Like, I, I never see a schizophren or a big bipolar person passing out all the time and thinking he's dying because my dad was personally someone who make depression every year, you know? So <clears throat> after that, I was tired of going to tragedy and I was mad. So I said, let's go to Bathurst because Bathurst, it was the best hospital like down here in Penicill, Academia. It was one hour of ride. I said, let's go to Bathurst. So I arrived in Bathurst. I remember I was not feeling good. So at that time there, I, I was about that much not even uh, that of dying. I was white, passing out, uh, tough coming out my mouth, uh, my eye like this. And they grabbed the wheelchair. Uh, my ex-girlfriend went in the hospital and said, my boyfriend is dying. So the security guard put me, pulled me in the wheelchair, I was passing out. As soon as I came in there, the COVID was just eating everywhere. So he look at me, you got COVID, put him a mask, get him out of here. We cannot treat you, that's COVID. You're gonna, you're gonna give us the disease and blah, 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 blah. And he look at the security guard that just put me in to take me the hell out of there fast. Like uh, they literally grabbed me and threw me back in the truck. So I said, fuck it, let's go to Miramichi. So I arrived in Miramichi, the other hospital there. And I said all the thing that I said to you guys, like blah, 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 how I'm feeling and everything. And said, okay, let's go. Let's make a scan of your heart and everything. So we make a scan. Doctor arrived to me, not even like, I wait there maybe 30 minutes. And after that, uh, you come with a sheet. Okay, you're going to take them pills. This, these are for stomach. These are for your stomach. Yeah, your stomach is irritated. But I told him I take vitamin C to try to keep up, uh, B50, CMOS, uh, Shedajids, and uh, all kind of product, and not eat. I was drinking them uh, bottle, their meal bottle, I don't remember the name, but I was drinking them, eating bananas and uh, orange juice. I know it's not good for us, but that was the only thing giving me energy because it was a lot of sugar in it, right? So after we went there, same night, I was not feeling good. It was still a big storm, and I said, fuck it. Uh, so we went to my mom's house, cannot make it in La Mecque because it was too bad. Uh, I stayed in my mom's house two days and my mom looked at me and said, Matthew, I never see you like that, you're not normal. Uh, you guys might as well hit another hospital. And I tell the only hospital maybe I'm going to get hurt is more, probably Alifaz. But Alifaz was too far for me because I didn't know if I will last the drive, you know. So we said, fuck it, let's head mountain so i step in the truck put that four four high and head that to mountain i remember right there and uh, the nurse looked at me and i told her all my symptoms like the wall was going like this i cannot walk uh, like this and uh, i was white uh, all here choke cannot breathe and she said maybe you got uh, antiphobia and then they gave me pill for that and then the same night i said <clears throat> that the nurse told me like uh, look matthew Grab yourself an hotel down here, and if you don't feel better, please come back tomorrow. And then the same night, that hit me again. I looked at my girlfriend and fuck it, like called the ambulance again. And uh, I'm going back to the hospital. Like they need to find out what I have. So I went back to the hospital. I remember, man, I was in the wheelchair again, kind of big wheelchair, but there was nothing in front, and I passed out literally, like in the floor. And I remember. Uh, that nurse there, when I go there, it was the same nurse as the same day, you know? And then she recognized me, so she ran right up to me, 
pick me up, bring me in the back thing there. She said, wait here, Matthew, I'm go grip. I'm gonna go grab you someone right here, right now. And it's, and it's right here. On the same time, as she said, he's a neurologic and he's one of the best. And he's gonna find you what you have. He's gonna work until they find. And then this is where I met Dr. Ali Mayo. And as soon as he saw me, he looked at me and said, how old are you? I said, I'm 27, I don't really feel good and I really need to take some tests and find out what I have. And then he said, just wait here a second. And then I remember they come with a big, uh, big bed. Matthew, lay down. I promise you, he gave me a big hug and a kiss on the, on the thing here and said, I promise you, Matthew, I'm gonna find what you have. You're too young to be diseased like that. So it was making me comfortable, you know, and then start making blood works and all kind of stuff. Uh, pension number in the back there with the big needle. Uh, that was very harmful and start making brain tests, uh, heart tests, uh, 48 hours, uh, scan uh, of the heart uh, and everything. See if tumors, bacteria or something. But in my test, it said, you uh, I see you got a big virus in you. What kind of virus? I don't know, but in sure there are very high virus. Like your system is, is not supposed to be like that. 27 years old, and then I remember the first thing I told him. I said, "Me, where I live, all around me, like they spray with tractors, poison or something like that. Maybe I'm poisoned." So that was the first thing I told him two years and eight months ago. And then he said, no, there's other patient that uh, have a uh, disease, almost, uh, almost the same as you, but I cannot put you with them before I make all the tests to make sure you got this neurologic disease. But me, I didn't have a clue what it was. So I start panicking and everything. And the only thing they gave me was at event for my panic attack and anxiety, cannot sleep, nothing after that. I've been two weeks. Couldn't sleep, eat, walk, even see, I complained 40, 14 days straight and then they put the, the prayers in front of me and tell me my last prayer and Dr. Maru said like, uh, you want to die here or you want to die home? Like I look, at it, I look at him and start crying, what do you mean? He said, you're very not doing well, we don't know what we ha you have, you're a mysterious boy. So. I said like, you got more tests to take or something, I know there's more tests. He said, yes, there's another one you didn't take, but all the other one that we take, it's all good. Everything's negative. But the only thing I was waiting for, it was the pension number I was having. And at the time, I think it was another brain disease because I was looking on the phone before I go up there and looking for the disease, like a uh, disease I could have with my symptom I was having. And then um, Dr. Ali Marejo went out and grabbed me the big, big, big test. You can't wait like years to get that test. It's like a big thing. You go in the tunnel, it move like this and film your brain and take pictures and everything. So after that, uh, there was a nurse there arrived to me. Oh, Matthew, I'm leaving. You need to go home. I'm giving you a ticket to go home. When we can't find whatever you have. And as soon as she said that, I stopped crying, like, you leave me here, I'm going to go home, I'm not going to feel better and nothing. And then Maru up in with the sheet in his paper, uh, with the sheet in his hand and said, Matthew, I found out what you have. And I was like, what I'm having? He said, your brain is, he said, oh, you sit down and after that, look at me, it's your brain. And I was like, what, cancer or tumor? And then said, no cancer, no tumor, but your brain is old like a person of 85 to 107 years old and you're 27 years old. I was having atrophy in the front lumbar, temporal uh, lesion on the brain too. And uh, he looked at me and said, I cannot understand, you're still up with what I see. Like, And I asked him honestly, like me, I'm the type of guy I got something to say, say it. Don't hide me nothing, I, I told him. If I got one day to live, five days, one week, one month, one year, tell me. I said, Maju, if you make six months, you're good. And right now it's been two years and eight months. I'm, I'm still alive. But the thing that take me out of the bed was my little girl because it was COVID. I cannot see anybody, nothing like that. I remember I started seeing it again, but it was all blurry everywhere. And my phone rang up and it was my little daughter at 1 a.m. And I grabbed the phone, she made FaceTime and she was crying and said, Daddy, please don't die. 
I heard you're gonna die there, and I start crying and praying the Lord, and I tell my, yeah, sorry about that. I tell my daughter that I'm not gonna die at the hospital, and they're gonna get home, and if I passed away, at least that you need to get prepared, and your brother, that at least I make her a promise, and I said I'm gonna get out of the hospital and go home and take more time I can to spend with you guys before I leave this world. Because I showed them a lot, my kids, and I was very mad that I get this because I was working out west. Already a pain in the ass and don't see them much. And after that, I get this disease, you know. I didn't, I didn't deserve this. And then I remember there, I called my buddy and said, fuck it, man, I'm going home and I'm gonna die home and that's it. Miracle can happen. So I start praying the Lord, praying the Lord and praying the Lord pleasing him to get me out of, of this hospital so I could see my daughter. After I see my daughter and everything, this is where I come to get energy again. Because me and her mom was divorced at the time there and I was seeing somebody else and her two was seeing somebody else and thing was not going, doing that much great, but still the kids, I never left my kids like one week, them one week, still, even I was sick, I was still bring the kids home even I was at bed like try to take more time with them and looking at movies and cuddle them and tell them I love them and how much I care for them and if something happened to me I don't want them to cry or something like that and after that this is where it begins to me giving me energy my daughter was like daddy wake up daddy it's time for you to wake up now we need to do activities before you go and I said, Kaylee, I cannot wake up. I cannot walk. I got no energy. She said, I'm going to help you, Daddy. I'm going to hold you and you're going to come with us. I'm going to do something. Imagine your kid grabbing you in the bed and bringing you outside to make something. It was pure bullshit. And my daughter and my kids were mad. And after that, my ex-girlfriend I was with, I was with. Uh, we separate because I was too sick and she was tired of me being like this in the bed. She cannot deal with this anymore. So to me, the first thing I said, I just called my my ex girlfriend, the one I have the child the child with, and uh, I told her like, look, I don't have much time. I don't know how much time I have. Maybe tomorrow, whatever after tomorrow, whatever I'll be dead, you know. So and her, she get divorced too, and the same time as me, like we broke up, and her, she broke up with her boyfriend. So I said like. You wanna at least make it a try or something like that. Like the only energy that can I can have to probably survive a more uh, long time is be with my children, you know. And then she said yes, give it a go. There was no no or all thing about it. it. Was yes right away, and she told me I will take care of you and uh, we get married this year on the month of May. And it's the best thing that can happen in my life. I make a bucket list. I try to do the more activity I can with my kids. Doesn't mean I'm sick, that I cannot run. And people looking at me all the time and pointing at me down here and telling me, Matthew, you don't look like someone sick. You don't look sick. You don't look this, you don't look that. I said, hey, even I'm sick, my world didn't stop. It stopped for me two years. I spent two years in a bed. Two years in a bed, I was 170 pounds. I, I come to 315 pounds, right now I'm 240 because I lose weight because it's only been six months right now, I'm out of the bed for real. And trying to live my best life with my kids and my wife and my family, my brother and everything. And since I'm sick, uh, I never get help from nobody. But the first year I got uh, the chômage, we call that, like it's a pay every two weeks. It was like a thousand bucks per two weeks. And I was living with that for one year, but right now it's been one year and eight months. I got no salary and my girlfriend's taking care of me, paying everything. My brother too, he work out with and my mom too. And I'm not missing of nothing. And But still, it's just to say that all in my life, I work a lot. I pay a lot of taxes and everything. And I asked the government at least, like, can you pay my medication? Oh no, we cannot help you, Matthew. We make some year of 100K. Yeah, but it's been two years and eight months. I don't have any salary. We got a house to pay. We got cars to pay. We got bills to pay. We got electricity to pay. I got two kids going to school. Sorry, three kids going to school. I got my two kids and my 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 wife right now. She got a kid when I made him. And the first time it was only six months. 
and right now he's 11 years old, you know. Uh, me and my wife, we only break up a year and a half, but uh, without that year, it's been 12 years we're together and we all been through a lot of stuff. Uh, where her house burned, I turned sick. Uh, I lose my grandpa, my grandma, my friends, three friends. They died down here of cancers and brain damage and heart disease at 27, 25, 26. I lose a lot of people and this is where I started getting anger and anger and anger and anger and this is what right now is keeping me alive, the anger of living in this country where you cannot have help. You cannot have nothing. You ask for help and this shit right in your face and telling you all kind of bullshit. And I tell the government, you won't win with me. There's no way. I will fight to the end. I make a promise to my kid my wife and my mom and my brother everybody's dying everywhere cancer brain disease heart disease liver disease name it like in my family the last five years and friends i maybe lost 15 percent that i know that was very close to me so that's it too so that was my story here um thanks for watching and i hope everybody stands up for us not uh, just only for me for her family her kids her wife mom dad, grandpa, grandson, our future. If we don't stand up right now, our future is gonna be broke in 10 years max. Me, I'm talking about Penesville Agadien here, here in Tragedy. If we don't stop them, 10 more years, we're all gone. We're having disease that never gonna be cured like me. I don't even wish what I have to my worst enemy. Do you imagine? I see the minister today and I told to him, he looked at me and said, you know what, Matthew, me too, I, I already have cancer. I said, yeah. I said, that's kind of funny too, eh? because down here, three quarters of the person that I know, and I know a lot of people, they got already cancer, or they having cancer right now, or brain disease, or liver disease, or whatever. There's too much disease for a small, healthy place like we're living in. Like, we got no more fish. They put poison in the water. We got no more fish, uh, no more trout no more salmon. I got videos of them throwing a bunch of stuff and you see the fish floating right away as soon as they put this in the water. It was all <clears throat> on white people uh, with a white suit and there was the ranger behind them, the one that's supposed to protect our forest, letting them spill them toxic poison in the water. So imagine our water is poison. Her field is poisoned, her ground is poisoned, her food is poisoned, everything is poisoned. How the fuck you want people to live like that? We cannot like live like that anymore. We need to stand up, we need to fight. We're in a free country, we need to talk, we need to stand up and be together around all them corrupted government.